This Torah class is brought to you by TorahAnytime.com. Welcome, everybody. Welcome, uh, welcome, everybody. Just welcome, everybody. Um, okay, first and foremost, we would like our, to thank our anonymous donor for tonight's delicious, nutritious uh, supper. Um, so thank you very, very much for the, for the honest honor. Uh, this is what people should know online, you know, like, I don't know why, you know, now I was thinking about it, I'm like, you say, like, please come to the class. Please come for supper. There's free supper here every Thursday night at the BJX location at Quentin Road at 1601, thank you, Quentin Road, at 8 p.m. Uh, there's free, and I am the entertainment uh, for the night. Uh, you know, pretty much, uh, you know, got to be realistic for what you are. So uh, there is uh, delicious food here, so thank you for the, uh, you know, the generous sponsors, and, um, and everyone is welcome to join us. Again, uh, this is a women's only class. So, okay, uh, that's... Number one. Number two, last, so last class, yeah, it was last week. Last week we gave a class. It was a little bit of a balagan, a little bit of a, you know, problematic. And uh, whoever's not familiar, just, I guess, listen to the last class because I, you know, I think the first, like, five minutes we were discussing the, the, you know, the issues that we were dealing with. But something that I discussed in last week's class, my, my brother-in-law calls me up. He listened to my class and he says, you know, something you said in the class was wrong. And I'm like, okay, so, so let me know. I like, I like when people tell me that I'm wrong because then I, like, I, need to, I feel like I need to correct it. So he was telling me, he says, uh, he says you know, you, you mentioned that what happened was is that we had to move locations. So when we moved locations, I was mentioning on camera that it's a schut, it's a merit for everybody who moved, who went and not only helped, but also just came in along and moved to the other location. The merit is, is that everybody that's going to forever watch this class online or listen to this class online, that goes, that goes in that person's merit because otherwise the class wouldn't have been given. So he said, he said that, that what I said was wrong. So I was like, what, what I said wrong? Like, you know, I've got sources, you know, I'm like, I'm about to pull out my stuff. I'm like, what you got? And he says, he said something very interesting. He said that, you know, what happens, you are only mentioned that somebody's going to get reward if someone listens to the class. But let's say point person A listens to the class and repeats something that you said to person B. So person B is now never listened to your class, but now he also gets the reward. You're also getting the reward. Everybody here is getting the reward for the people also that it comes, you know, as a, as a uh, you know, trigger, uh, trigger effect. So, Kazaka um, Boha, my brother-in-law, so he's, he is correct. So, um, you know, congratulations. Yeah, your spiritual, yeah, your spiritual bank accounts just uh, went up. That being said, Okay, now we could begin. But before we begin, when we finished last, so this week we were doing uh, Free Will Part 2. When we finished Part 1, I didn't have like a good feeling in my, you know, like after I give a class, I liked it. One of my things that I try to do, you know, besides speaking very fast, which I, you know, constantly work on myself to try to speak faster and faster, I know this is what people want. Um, and besides speaking fast, I, I try to bring things very clearly. I, that's, I think that is the most important aspect when delivering a, a, a topic. It doesn't matter whatever the topic is. Even if, you, if you, you're in a company and you're trying to educate someone, the more easier and simpler you're able to educate that person, the more likely they'll be able to absorb it. And I didn't feel so great about last week's class. So what I want to do is for the first like three, four, or five minutes, I want to do a quick recap on everything we spoke about. Well, not everything, but uh, the, the, the important things that we spoke about in last, at last week's class. So... As a recap to part one, we said, we first asked, what is, uh, why do we have free will? So we gave a few answers. Number one, if you don't have free will, you are like a robot. If you're like a robot, there is absolutely no purpose for you to be there. Now think about it this way. You have a computer. That computer in itself doesn't have a purpose. It has a purpose to you, the user of the computer. The computer is not going to be like, well, you know, after, you know, they're going to come out with the next uh, version, I'm going to go to computer heaven and I will be, you know, forever happy, you know, counting zero and ones. It doesn't work that way. Computer, the second that computer is done, it's done. The whole purpose of a robot, the whole purpose of a computer is only for the person that is using it. So what are we? We're not a computer. And if we are not a computer, the only way that we would not be a computer is if we have the ability to have free will. Computers do not have free will. Robots do not have free will. The only way that we would have any meaning to anything of our life would be that we have a free so that's number one. We said we need to have free will. Why? Because there's no purpose otherwise. Number two, we mentioned the idea of the bread of shame, which we brought based off Kabbalistic concepts that when you're getting something, if you have two options of getting something as a free gift or as you earned it, you will enjoy it more if you earned it. Now, granted, if someone's going to be like, hey, I have a yacht for you, you'd be like, no, 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 no. I want to work for it. No, I mean, like, you're not going to do that. I'd be like, 
you know, just bring it over, no problem, you know, dock it over there. How many foot are we talking about? You know, you're not going to start asking, you'll accept the gifts, you know, we all want gifts, but the idea is, is that after the fact, if you already had the yacht, I don't know why I picked yacht, right? If, uh, whatever it is that you, you know, whatever it is that you, something you really want that's out of your, your reach, if something you get that after the fact, you would prefer to have earned it rather than to have to receive that as a free gift. So God and his mercy went and he gave us free will to earn us the eternal reward in Olam Abba, which means God technically could have just given us a reward. God could do anything, could have given us a reward. But what did God do? God said, no, it's going to be so much more greater if you earn it. And if you earn it, that's the level that, you know, you can't even, you can't even compare the idea. And we know that the greatest, one of the purposes of this world is to earn the greatest pleasure that ever is possible. And in order for a pleasure to be great, to be amazing, it has to keep on increasing. You ever realize if you eat something delicious, or if you do any pleasure, the more that you do it, the less pleasure that you get. Which is something very interesting. You think, okay, you love, uh, you know, eating steak. So you'll eat, a, you know, one steak and you'll finish it, and then you eat another steak, and you'll finish it, and uh, for the American population, you eat another four more steaks, and you'll finish it, and eventually, you know, what happens is, you'll start getting sick of it. You'll start be like, oh my God, I, you, you're like, you smell steak, you're like, you know, like, oh, you know, like, I, you know, you, no thank you anymore. But like, 45 minutes ago, uh, if you're American, four minutes ago, right before you ate those four steaks, you were willing to go and pay $200 or f- whatever it is, $85 for a steak. And all of a sudden, now you're gagging when you're just thinking about steak. Why? Because the pleasure, the more that you indulge in the pleasure, the less pleasure that you actually gain from it. So in order for a pleasure to have the utmost pleasure, so, so pleasure so many times, the utmost pleasure it means that it has to keep on growing. In order for it to keep on growing, there's a few things that have to come into place. Number one, what has to happen is that you have to have it based off your free will. You have to work for it. When you work for it, you gain, you, you enjoy it so much more. That's number two. Number three, we spoke about a relationship. A relationship, one of, the, one of the greatest pleasures they can have in this world is to have a relationship, a connection with the divine, with Almighty, with God. Now, in order to have a relationship, in order to have a loving relationship, it has to be free will. You could force someone, you know, to pretend to love you, but you can't force someone to really love you inside. The love has to come from their own free will. You can't, if somebody gets, a, you know, an arranged marriage that they did not want to be in, they are not going to be happy until they want to be there. And this is a very big secret in, in marriage in general. If you're in a marriage and you don't want to be there, you're never going to be happy. You have to change that aspect that I want to be here. And this is, you know, one, one falls that we have in relationships is once you have one step out of the door, once you're not committed anymore to work on it, it's done. There's nothing to talk about it. That's why when, when, when you're working on, on any relationship, two parties need to be 100% you know, involved and devoted. Otherwise, you know, it may work, it may not work, but it's not going to work to the optimal level. So that is number three. So that, that answers the question, why do we have free will? Why do we need free will? The next question that we asked, was if God knows the future, then how do I have free will? Now, I'm not going to get to, the, we went into detail last class and explaining it. I'm not going to get into that. I just want to give you the brief, my most personal favorite answer is the time machine answer. The time machine answer. So the question is again, the question is, is that if God knows what I'm going to do tomorrow, and I'm supposed to do it because God obviously knows that I'm going to do it, then how do I have any free will to go and change that? Because that's supposed to happen already. So the example that we gave is, let's say, you know, you have a time machine, and you go one day in the future, and you see some scene happening before you. You see, I don't know, you see a car accident happening, and you watch this car accident happening, you see this car accident, and you see it flip and roll like 15 times, and then this person comes out, you know, unda- you know unhurt, and this person comes out, you know, hurt, whatever it is, all the details of the scenario. Then you go back to the present, and then you wait through the, you know, through the day, and then you come to the same scene, you come to the same location where you know what's going to happen in the future. And you see you know, a guy going and he's drunk driving, and he's going this way, and he's going that way, and then he hits the car, and then they start tumbling exactly 15 times. Let's say even that you told somebody about it. Did your knowledge of the information change any free will of the people who are driving in the accident? And the answer is 100% no. Just because you have the knowledge, it doesn't change any fact of what actually would happen. So when God has a knowledge of the future, it doesn't change the fact that you have free will. The easiest, and I think the easiest way to understand this, is this, is this in, the, in, the, um, in the time machine example. Okay, now this... Um, this, and one final point I want to I speak about uh, from last week's class, and this one I feel like, like this is the part that I felt we didn't get so clear, so I want to get, uh, maybe we did, I don't know. So, but, but I want to I clarify this idea. Can my free will affect you? So this is what we spoke last week in, in the class, that if I have free will and everything that's predestined is already supposed to happen to you, then can I affect you in any way? And the answer is if you think that everything is predestined, then technically no. 
Everything that's predestined is supposed to happen, so I cannot change that. The only difference is, okay, maybe there's going to be a different messenger, maybe there's going to be somebody else that's going to do it, but the bottom line is, everything that's supposed to happen to you is supposed to happen to you, but then, the, then it, you're sort of loosening the strength of free will. Do you, you guys have followed me so far? Okay, good. Okay, so this should be a review. Everybody should draw on that. Uh, so the idea is, is that, the idea we have to understand this. So the question is, can my free will affect other people? So uh, we quoted, and we're not going to go into the details, but we quoted something like this. said that everything that happens in the world happens because there is divine permission. God checks off and says, yeah, I want this to happen. But, and listen to this very carefully, but not everything happens because there was a divine decree. There are some things that God didn't initially decree for it, but he let it happen. And he checked it off on it. Do you follow that little nuance that, that we mentioned? That everything that happens, God approves of. Because otherwise, God would not approve of it. But not everything that happens was an original divine decree. Meaning... You are able to manipulate, you are able to change something that was not originally in the script. I guess that's the scariest thing of free will. Yeah, that's how powerful it is. But let's, let's explain that a little bit. Uh, first, we gave off a proof. We gave off a proof in Shmuel Bet, in chapter 24, verse 14, where it says that King David was, was nervous. He says, I don't want to fall against man, i rather fall against God. I'd rather God, and the, and the, the commentators that go there and interpret it, that if there is a choice of a tragedy happening... It's better to have a famine than a war. Why? Because God is in charge of the famine, but war, there's human will involved. But the obvious question is, if everything is predestined, if everything is predetermined, if nothing could happen to a person, only if God decrees it, then what's the difference if God does it or if a human does it? It makes absolutely no difference. If everything that's supposed to happen to you is supposed to happen to you, then what does it make a difference? Let a God do it, let a human do it. But yeah, what does King David say in Shmuel Beth over there? He says, he says, no, because God could have mercy. But still, the question is, but I don't understand. If everything is predestined, then it shouldn't make a difference. What's the difference, God or not? So Rabbi Chaim Kanievsky goes and he writes like this. And he, he goes like this. I don't want to quote for you. A person cannot be killed without a heavenly decree, but against human free will, one needs more merit to be saved. Which means is, is that everything that happens, there is a check to off that it, that it should have happened. But if there is human free will involved... If you are to get, if you are the subject of that free will, which means somebody, somebody else did something to you, and that was someone else's free will, you need more merit to be saved from that than, let's say, something from a non-free will, you know, entity to happen. And let, let's explain the way that we explain the Orchat Sadikim. Also, the same concept. The Orchat Sadikim, Mishal Simcha, goes and it says like this, and I'm going to quote it. It goes and he says like this. Remember that no benefit or damage ever occurs from people without the Creator's permission. This does not mean that we cannot affect each other. It simply means we cannot affect each other without God's permission. So we see over here is something very important. Number one, everything that's supposed to happen to you is supposed to happen to you. But there is an element of free will that can, that can change something. Now again, it was supposed to happen to you, but it didn't necessarily need to happen to you. If you had the sufficient merit, it would have necessarily ha- had to happen to you. Now, I don't want you to delve on this too much because you'll go down a rabbit hole and then you'll start pulling out here and be like, what does life mean? You know, like, you know, am I real? You know, like you're going to go. But the concept is very, very important. Very, very important to, to understand is that, that both things are at 100%. You have free will at 100%. In most scenarios. We'll speak about that. That's, uh, that's what today we're going to speak about. And everything that's supposed to happen to you, you have a munah bitachon, that if it happened to you, it, that's, it was a decreed, yes, 100% as well. Is that clear so far? Okay. Just say yes, even if, whatever, it doesn't matter. Yeah, yeah, sure, yeah. Okay. Um, you're not getting tested on this, you know. <laughs> Maybe after 100. I don't know. Go over that, but then, like, is it, if something, like, goes wrong, or you, you make a mistake, so it's technically not a mistake, you make a mistake. Oh, so this is where, regret? this is where you have such a big, difference in like the way that people how interpret and munah. So let's say, and I, don't, I think this is what you're asking, um, let's say someone does a sin. And what do they say? Be like, okay, God must have wanted me to do the sin. Is that what you're going at? No, I'm really, okay. I mean, I mean like making a mistake, like I made the wrong choice. Not, not oh, mistake. oh, you mean like that. I made so, the wrong decision, I, I worked in the wrong place. So if you made the decision made from a logical you know? perspective, you know, based on, technically, so the answer can go really both ways. Technically, yes. First of all, it was, it was checked off that God, that you should, you know, you, that, that messed up. And I'll give you an example. Yeah, let me give you an example. It's easier to understand as an example. A man and a woman fall in love and they get married. Really, the, the Torah way is really, the, the, well, it's not the Torah, the real way is a man and a woman get married and then they fall in love. But whatever it is, the, uh, you know, that, so let's say they get married together, a man and a woman. And then, you know, unfortunately, it doesn't go so well. It's kind of rocky. So one of them starts thinking, maybe I made a mistake. Maybe I should have married her. And what all of a sudden happens, or maybe I shouldn't marry him. What all of a sudden happens? All the previous relationship comes up. Be like, you know who would have been a much better husband? 
everybody else except for him. You know, like, obviously, you know, like, you know, like you start concentrating, calculating everything else. Like maybe I made a wrong, a wrong mistake. That is not a correct way to, to look at life. That is not a correct way to do it because you're living in the past, you're not living in the present. If you're living in the past, you're never going to be able to move forward. The idea is that you are where you are. If God allowed it to happen, that means God checked it off, that it should have happened. Now, granted, you're in a sticky situation right now. What you need to do is be able to focus and get out of that situation right now. That's the, that's, and it's very hard to say and think that when you are in the situation. It's easier to say when you're out of the situation. And a lot of things, and in fact, 99% of things are much easier said than done. Uh, the, but the idea, the idea still stands is that if something happened and you, that God checked it off and it was supposed to happen. Granted, did it happen because you messed up? Possibly. Yeah, you have free will that you can mess up. You can make a bad choice and end up in a very, very terrible situation for a long time. But it doesn't mean that you can't fix it. Anything can be fixed, anything can, and, and it can, be, anything can be saved. Okay, so now the question that we have to ask, and the last thing that we mentioned, is the last thing that we're doing on the review, is if everything is supposed to happen, technically supposed to happen, then why do we get punished? Why do we get punished for that? So we said technically you could alter the person's life based on your free will, but even more so, the Gemara Makot, page 10, says that in a way that a person wants to go, that's the way that, they're gonna, that, the, that, that the heaven is going to direct them. Meaning that if somebody wants to do a sin and really wants to do it and tries really hard, eventually God is going to assist that person. They're going to assist that person to be able to do that sin. Someone wants to steal and tries really hard and always fails, but eventually what's going to happen is that they're going to be, if somebody really wants to go, the direction that they want to go in their life is the direction that they get, uh, that, that heaven puts it away. So now, if someone did, if person A did something bad to person B, person A can say, listen, it was supposed to happen anyways. I was just a messenger. Don't shoot the messenger. Uh, but the answer, the answer, very obvious answer is, is that A, you didn't have to, I'm, I'm talking, Mr. A, you didn't have to be the messenger. Mr. C could have been the messenger. Mr. D, E, F, G, anybody could have been the messenger. Who said that you have to be the messenger? So you get, if you do something bad against somebody else, if you hurt somebody else, granted, maybe that was supposed to happen to that person. And probably it was. Obviously it was. But don't say like, okay, well, it was supposed to happen. I was just a messenger. Don't, don't take away anything from your blame. No, no, no. You are to blame. You have to do chuba. You have to go and fix it. You have to go and, and deal with all the situations that you put and you messed up. But know that it didn't have to be you. It could have been everybody else. Anybody else could have, you know, could have happened. Okay, so that is, uh, that is a short recap from last week. Is this clear? Okay, this is clear. This is, now we have to discuss uh, you know, on this, week's, uh, this week's topic. Okay, so there's a Mishnah in Pirkei Avot, in the third chapter. It says something very interesting. It says, Chaviv Adam Beloved is a man that he was created in the image of God. And then it says, furthermore, Chiba Yitera, a given a greater love, a greater show of love, Nodat Losh and that it was known to him that it was, that it was, that God was, that human was created in God's image. First of all, we have to understand is God doesn't have an image. God doesn't look like a, you know, like the cartoons do it, like a guy who's driving a red sports car with a long white beard, bald in the front, but a guy, you know, long, you know, thing over here, smoking maybe a fat cigar on the clouds. That's not God, right? That's not, God doesn't have an image of a human being. So what does it mean that we were created in God's image? That's question number one. Question number two is, what do you mean that, you know, like, it's nice, it's a great thing, it's a, uh, you know, chiba, it's a beloved thing that we were created in God's image, but even greater thing is that we know that we were created in God's image. Like imagine, and this is how Rabbi Noach Weinberg explains it. Rabbi Noach Weinberg goes and explains it like this. Just imagine someone gives you a beautiful present, a nice gold watch, and then they go and they say like, here's a watch, and be like, hey, I'm giving you this watch as a present because this is how much I care for you. Be like, okay, you know, you don't have to spell it out, it's, you know, pretty obvious. Like, I like, no, by the way, this watch is for me. You know, that's what like what, what is what is that idea that God that it, now it's greater to us that it's known? So Reb Noah Weinberg is explained like this. It says that first of all, what does it mean that we are created in God's form? God doesn't have a form, but rather what it means is just as God has free will, we are created that we have free will as well. That was that's what it means that we are created in God's in God's form. Now the idea that that God know that that we know that we have free will. Now that it's now that it's it's known. You hear? Oh. You know what's so funny? I hear myself over here. I just thought somebody was on the phone on this side. That's why I wasn't looking at you guys. I thought I didn't want to, you know. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> I didn't, you know, like, because I, I hear myself. Okay. So there is a thing that you need to do. Everybody that's sitting on this couch, I have to give you a blessing. 
The blessing is, is the Bezrat Hashem, everybody here is married? No one's married, right? Bezrat Hashem, you should find a shiduch, uh, you know, bekarov, and everything should go smooth, and everything should go happy, and should have a bite, uh, you build a bite in the man Bezrat. Now already that we're giving bachot, everybody in the room also should have a... Now that we're giving... <laughs> so, yeah. Okay. So now, the idea is like this, okay. The idea is that not only that God, you know what it is, is, is that when you see, when you see when you see some sort of fault in somebody else, that means that you really have that fault inside you. So if you see somebody like, you see everybody's just like an angry person, be like, maybe check yourself for a second. You know, maybe there's something going around inside you that there's, here's a perfect proof of it. You know, because I heard that, I, it was crazy, because I hear some, you know, words, I'm like, I don't know what's going on over there. You know, like, I don't know what, you know, I'm hearing myself. It's literally, you can't, that's a perfect example for the situation. No, nobody in camera. No, what I say, like, there's some jokes that you could only get inside class. The Torah you could probably get outside, but the jokes you have to come to class in here. Okay. So now, the, there's got to be some benefit for people coming to the class. Besides the spiritual reward. There's got to be, bes- and the food. Oh, you know what, there's plenty. Okay, there's no. All right. So anyways, so the idea is like this. The idea is that not only we were, bo- we were created in the image of God, that we have free will, but we know that we have free will. Now think of this scenario. Imagine somebody's living in dire poverty his entire life. And they're 90 years old, no kids, you know, like, unfortunately, very, very tough life. And they come to a certain point that, you know, the home attendant is helping over them. And suddenly the, there's like a squeak on the floor and the, one of the floorboards just like shoots up. And the, the home attendant looks down and sees things that are shining and gleaming. There's a bag full of diamonds in there. And they open it up and they bring it to the owner and be like, and be like look what you found under the floorboards. And he had this house from, you know, the 1800s. And he's like, are you kidding me? He says, I had millions of worth of diamonds my, this entire, my entire life sitting under the floorboards and I'm living under dire poverty. Now, if you would ask me, if a person has a few weeks left to live, maybe, truth is it's not, because he can still do, you know, tzedakah with that money. But in a secular world, if you have an option, if somebody is, it could find out that he was sitting on millions of dollars his entire life and he was struggling his entire life, and when does he find it out? A day before he dies, and he's nothing that he could do about it. That would be more painful than not knowing that he had that, that he had the money. So the idea is that God told us, we, not only do we know that we have free will, but God meant, told us we have free will. So it's, a, it's an extra present, and that's imagine having this, this bag of diamonds, but not finding it out at the end. Finding it out at the beginning that you have this gold mine that you're sitting on. Now, now that we know that everybody has free will, the truth is not everybody utilizes it. And this is really the, the, the core of, of, of the class that I want to speak about tonight. The... You know, when I speak to, let's say, people, um, every once in a while I get one of these, and the second I get it, I just start smiling when I hear this question, because I know I'm going to enjoy it. Um, What they say is, how do I know God exists? And says, if I were to know God exists, then I would be religious. And I'm like, oh, yes, thank you, God, all right, <laughs> let us begin, I crack my neck, you know, I do some stretches, you know, and be like, let's get started, and, you know, I go to him, and I say, okay, let's start with something else, um, do you smoke, I don't know, generally people I speak to smoke for some reason, so they're like, yeah, you know, I, I, uh, I, I do smoke, do you know that smoking is unhealthy, now, I'm not, uh, what is a certain general, you know, warning, you know, that, you know, like, do you know that it's unhealthy? Be like, yeah, yeah, I, I know it's unhealthy. But yeah, you still smoke. Be like, I'm like, yeah. So I'm like, so you know that there is something that's true out there that is bad for you, yet you're still doing it. Meaning that just because you have knowledge of something, it doesn't mean that you're going to listen to it. Think about this case. There's a diabetic, you know, 550 pound man, you know, sitting over there. And he's been staring at this chocolate cake for about two hours. And he's thinking, you know, his sugar is up the, you know, the, you know, the roof. And he's like, he's like, I really want that. And he's talking to it. He's hallucinating at this point, right? They're having conversations. <laughs> and he really wants his cake. And he says, you know what? And he goes and he eats the cake. Now, did he know that it was bad for him? 100% he knew it was bad for him. Then how come? So, so let's break it down like this. You have two wills. Do it or not do it. It's as simple as that. There's no like middle ground. Like let me smell it. Let me like inhale it. There's no like, generally there's not, you know, in the normal sense. There's no, there's no. I mean, if you ever walk into like someone's house and they're like, in, you know, they're getting high off sugar. What I would recommend is turn around and leave um, as, uh, as, you know, as fast as you can. But the scenario is there's, there's two situations. There's two situations. One, eat it. One, don't eat it. What's the right thing to do? Not to eat it. Does he know that? Yes. But he still eats it. Like, I don't understand. How does that make sense? 
How does that make sense? So you have a knowledge. So I tell this guy that doesn't believe in God, he says, oh, so if you believe in God, I know many people that believe in God, but yet they don't listen to God. Now, I'm not saying that they mess up every once in a while. No, you know, like, like on purpose, they're not, they're not, uh, they're not listening to God. So the, the idea that you just think that if you have knowledge, you automatically would listen to it is not necessarily. So let's say you have over here. Now let's try to understand this scenario. The scenario is there's a guy that's smoking. He knows that it's bad, yet he's still doing it. Why would anybody do that? Because there's more than two factors at play over here. There's a third factor, and that factor is you. You have the free will to decide, be like, you know what, I know it's bad, but it tastes so good, or it inhales so good, or I don't know how that works. <laughs> I, it, it's so good, you know, it makes me relax, whatever it is, it, you know, that I'm willing to take the risk. Now, where does that come? That's free will. You have the free will to decide that even though something is bad for you, you will still do it. You're still going to go and you're still going to uh, eat something, do something that is bad for you. And this is not related to, this is all examples, hanging out with bad friends, you know, speaking Lashon You know things before you do it that it's bad, yet you still do it. Why? Because that is, you have the free will to do it. But all that being said, that in my opinion is not the essence of free will. That in my opinion is the essence of using your urges. When you go and you have two options in front of you, and you do something that is counterintuitive, counterproductive for you as a being, and you're doing that, that is, you're using your free will for sure. But even more so is that you're not using your free will. That you're going based on your animalistic urges. You have two options, and you decide, you know what's good for you, you know what's not, and you decide, you know what, I'm going to go, and I'm going to go do the thing that is bad for me. You know, you have uh, um, the, the idea that, first of all, we have to understand, how do things get distorted? How does this get distorted to begin with? The knowledge in itself, how does it get distorted? How do we have two very obvious points? One is bad, one is good. How do we go for the bad? And this, all, this traces back to the sin of Adam and Chava, the sin of the, of the tree, of the Etz Adat. When Adam and, and the, the Rambam, and Moron Nebuchim goes and explains this. When Adam ate from the tree, before he ate from the tree, if you think about it, what did he gain? He gained the knowledge of good and bad. Now he knows the difference between good and bad. Now, isn't that a reward? Like, how is that a punishment? Be like, okay, now you know between good and bad. Awesome. You know, like, before we didn't know about good and bad. This is awesome. Now we know between good and bad. How is this a punishment that now you get to know between good and bad? The answer is the reality changed. Beforehand, explains the Rambam, beforehand, there was no good and bad. There was true and false. It was as simple as that. You knew something was bad and you knew something was good. You would never do something bad because it would be idiotic. It's like putting your hand in fire. Like, okay, well nowadays, you know, somebody, but normal people are not going to put their hands in fire and get, and get burned from it because it's just, it, it just makes no sense. It's obvious. That's what it have been like to make a sin before the sin of the, of the etzadat. It would be like putting your hands in fire and be like, <laughs> yeah, it's suntan, no. <laughs> you know, like, you know, like it's, it's an idea. It doesn't make any sense at all. But afterwards, what happened afterwards? Afterwards, it changed from true and false to good and bad. Meaning that now, beforehand, there was no, there was no argument. You knew what was good and you knew what was bad. Afterwards, you'd be like, okay, I know it's good and I know it's bad, but the bad feels kind of good. You know, so like, you know, like, you know, you start, like all of a sudden the bad is a little bit, you know, manipulative. You know, it's a little bit has, a, you know, something became grayer. There is more benefits that you, you wouldn't see beforehand. So it changed the aspect that beforehand, what was true and what was false, all of a sudden now became sort of like, well, yeah, I know this is wrong and I know I shouldn't smoke, but kind of feels good, you know, and I'll, fine, I'll take the risk. You know, and then they start quoting you a statistic. Well, 95% of people don't die, die of car accidents. You know, they're like, okay, so don't smoke and don't drive. I don't know what you want to tell you. It's like, like, you know, they try to go and they convince themselves, whatever it is that they do, but all of a sudden things became greater. Before the sin of Etzadas, no one would ever smoke if they knew that it was bad. So, the, this is the idea of how the, the reality became distorted. But in essence, when somebody goes and when somebody does something bad, they're using their urges. They're using their animalistic urges. So, in essence, you're not only not using your free will, you're using the opposite of free will. You're using your urges. And, and to explain it like this, I have had, um, you know, people, you know, uh, you know when, I, when I speak to, to you know, the same group of people, that, uh, you know, say like, hey, you know, if I become religious, my life is very restrictive. I can't do this on Shabbat, I can't eat this, I can't hang out with this, you know, gender, I can't do it, you know, do, I, a whole list of things that I'm not supposed to be doing. It says, here, I am more free. I'm able to do whatever I want. And the truth is, is that it's not necessarily, that's not true. 
when you're going and when you're doing whatever you want, you're not doing whatever you want. You're doing whatever your urges and your animalistic desires wants. You're not in essence having your be like, okay, now I'm free. Just the opposite. When you're not listening to the Torah, that's when you're not free. You're not, what does the Torah do? The Torah gives you the ability. You know what, what the, the ultimate use of free will is? It's to say no to something that you want. That is free will. That is, you know something is bad. You know that you're not supposed to do it, but yet you want to do it, but yet you say no. That is free will. That is the idea. That is the optimal. That's what you're talking about, the highest level of free will. And this is where the tests really lie in. The idea of free will, that even though you have the ability to say yes, and you have the ability to say no, but you say no even though you want to say yes. The, uh, and this is what the Torah says in Pirkei Avot, chapter 6, uh, that says, There is nobody that is free only if somebody is going and learning Torah. Because with Torah, you have the ability, you learn to say no. You have the ability to say no. When you know that you're able to say no, that's when you know you have free will. So if somebody's going and does whatever they want on you know, Shabbat, whatever he wants, anything throughout their, throughout their life, that is not being free. You're locked to your desires. You're locked to your inner animal essence. You're not doing what you really want to. You're doing whatever your desire says. So how are we better than animals? How animal wants, they desire something, they do it. That, how are we any better? The, the way that we're better is when we get to say no. Is that clear? This is the idea of the Gemara in Kiddushin, which we've been quoting almost every class, that it says, that Kiddush Baruch goes and says, Barati etzahara, I created the evil inclination of Barati Torah Tavlin, and I've created the Torah as the antidote. The evil inclination is here, that gives you free will, and we'll explain that shortly. But what's the antidote to it? The antidote to go and actually utilize the free will to the maximum potential that you can, that's the Torah, because the Torah teaches you what you should say yes to, and what you should say no to. You have the ability to be very calculated in through all your decisions in your life. Okay, so now, I want to share with you something from Rabbi Eliyahu Dessler. In Mechtav Meliyahu, he writes like this. And he says, everyone's with me so far? These classes are philosophical, so I, you know, I, hope, I don't know, I mean, the truth is, the past like four months we've been philosophical. So, um, okay, so you have here, you see these two papers? These are two armies, right? Two sides, let's use my hands, sorry, so everybody can see. These are two armies. And the way, think about an olden day battle. In an olden day battle where it was hand-to-hand combat, the battle took place in one location. It was where these two people, where these two groups met. That's where the battle happened. Now, everything on this side belonged to this person's property. Everything to this side belonged to this person's property. There was no fighting over here, and there was no fighting over here. There was fighting right over here. Does that make sense? Okay, whoever is listening on audio, good luck. Um, <laughs> so you're you're fighting right over here in this in this particular area. This is where the battle is, and now, let's say this person, this group, of, this group of army, whatever, beats them and fights it over here. So now, this territory, they're conquered already. But this territory, they're not fighting anymore. It's over. Like, you know, it's ours, we won, now we're fighting over here. Granted, you can move back and forth, but once you beat a certain area of war, you move on to the next, you're not fighting at that previous war. Says Rav Dessler, the same thing works in free will. The way that it works in free will is that you have free will in a particular point. Everything that you do has a point of free will. And that's where you're fighting with it. When you beat that, and we'll explain what that means, you're no longer fighting that. Free, you have a new free will, but it's different. And, and what's that? So let me, let me explain this, uh, the, you know, this idea. The majority of choices that we do in our life is not based off pure 100% free will. We just do it without thinking. Think about it this way. Um, it could be because of the way that you are educated also. Some people are educated. I'll give you an example of, of uh, Lashonara versus murder. You go and you ask, you know, 99% of the people, be like, would you murder somebody? Be like, absolutely not. Um, and well, you can't ask somebody, would you listen to Lashon Hara? But be like, hey, listen, you know, like, hey, want to have a Lashon Hara meeting? You know, like, I guess, uh, well, some people will be like, I'll be right there, you know, like, I don't know what's the B T W R T R V U X Y Z, whatever it is, uh, B R B. Okay, so um, whatever it is, you know, you'll be like, the idea is that it's something very interesting. Nobody would commit murder, but people will still listen to evil inclination. They're both sins. Obviously, they're very, you know, we're not, we're not talking about the same level. We're not, you know, we're not comparing those two. But how is it that one is okay? Or, you know, like, okay, I really shouldn't do it. Okay, but tell me, tell me I'm not going to believe it, but just tell me, tell me anyways. You know, like, <laughs> I'm not in a college. You know, like, no, come on, tell me. Tell me. You know, like, you're not, whatever it is, you're still going to go and you're still going to listen to it. You're still doing it, as opposed to one thing you're not going to do. The idea is that the way that we're brought up, the society, it's not only Judaism, it's society. Society is like, you know, murder is very bad according to everybody. Uh, unless you're German, uh, whatever, you know, did we just take our right turn? I'm talking about Nazis, okay, so, uh, you know, then it's, it's not, 
I don't, it's like you guys never come to class anymore. Like you don't know, you don't anticipate this happening. Okay, so. Um, <laughs> oh, that's true also. Okay, so. Mur- but, but you know that the Nazis did not see killing Jews as murder. They, it wasn't a bad thing. It was, you, you know, it was a cleaning process. It was, yeah. So. Like I'm not, I should, I'm not like something that's shocking and be like, what? Really, the Germans? What are they doing? But like, you know, like, like I never knew. You know, like, um, so the the idea is is that when when you have when you have this this one point where it's a sin, but yet you're doing it. Another point where it's a sin, but yet you're not doing it. It's based on your, uh, you know, Rabbi Kiva Tatz calls it the Bechira point, your free will point. Wherever your free will point is, that's where you have you have the um, you have the fight. So for some person. The free will will be to keep Shabbat or not to keep Shabbat. That's going to be where the free will, that's where the battle is, right over there. For somebody else, it's not going to be that. The, you know, it's going to be to learn on Shabbat or not to learn on Shabbat. Let me give you even a better example. For some, for so, for, for some you know, person, for some, let's say a woman, modesty would not mean being fully modest. It means everything is covered. Everything is covered, that's considered modest. For somebody else, it's like everything's not covered and everything's tight. Now, both is a modesty test, but for each person, the test point is in a different, a different level. Because for the person that is already well advanced in the modesty stage and they already know what they need to do, they're not in the same point of, of free will uh, in that essence as somebody who's just beginning to begin in Judaism. Does that make sense? Are you guys with me so far? Okay, that's good. Challenge. It's not the same challenge. Thank you very much. So... It's always free will, but the actual free will. It's below the exactly. For some, like, that's the way that I, I explain people. Let's say for, for them keeping Shabbat, they're like, okay, for you to keep Shabbat and me to keep Shabbat, we're too. Di- I love Shabbat, and I, I you know, I, I, I wait for it all the week, and I can't wait to shut off my phone. I can't wait to do, you know, to get rid of it. For me, it's enjoyable. I love it, and it's easy. For you, it's going to be very difficult to do it because you never kept it before. And it's very, you know, your whole family doesn't keep it. So the free will is different. The free will still stands over there, but the, the, the battle is in a different place. Okay? All right. So now, this is the idea the, that we said in Pekia, in the fourth, fourth chapter, that mitzvah gorarat mitzvah and avera gorarat avera. What does that mean? It means that a good deed drags another good deed along with it, and a bad deed drags another bad deed with it. And the idea is like this, that when you do a good deed, um, let's, let's actually, let's flip it over. It's easier to do it in a bad deed. If you do, if you do something bad, the Chachamim tells us, when you do something bad the first time, you know that you did something bad. You do bad the second time, maybe like, okay, by the third time, it's already permitted for you. Sometimes when you go five, ten times, it's ready mitzvah. You're ready, you know, you're ready, you're ready to switch it. Now, what is the idea that all of a sudden becomes permitted to you? The idea is that the first time you do it, your free will is right over here. And this, let's say, let's say that my right hand is the good inclination, my, bat, my, my left hand is the evil inclination, right? And, and the battle is right over here. Should I do it? Should I not do it? And then I decide, you know what? I'm going to do this sin. And then, you know, all of a sudden it moves over here. I, I got into the, well, technically it goes this way, right? It goes that the evil inclination is beating into the, the good inclination's, uh, you know, battleground. And the more that I do it, the more that I push the battle over, the, over here. Now it's no, more, it's no more even a test if I'm going to do it or not. It's the level of the test that I'm going to, I'm going to do it. Now that is a very, very deep concept to, you know, to accept. So just listen to it in, in, a superficial, uh, in a superficial level. When you do something good, you're moving your free will point. You're moving your Bechia point. So when, when, when you're doing something good, the more often... So what's the easiest example? Someone who keeps Shabbat. The first time is very difficult. The thousandth time, it's very easy. All of a sudden, so now you're moving. Does that make sense? That you're moving the, the place. Okay, good. So this is... This, but now we have to speak about liability. So if it's based on your own choices that the Bechia point moved on, so someone could be, okay, fine, listen. I did many sins. Now I'm over here. I'm so bad into it that, okay, what can I do? I don't have free will anymore. Like, no, 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 no. You're still going to get, you're still responsible for everything that you put yourself into because you put yourself into that situation. So even though that you're not on the same, you don't have the same test that you had five years ago before you start smoking crack, but now you still have, you still, all that is all your fault because you started it. It's, it's all based on your, and I'll get, I'll get you in a second. All, all that is still on your. It's still on you. So, the idea is is that is that if it's your fault that you moved your free will point, you're still responsible for every. Even though you don't have the same free will as you had before. Now, of course, you have the same free will, but it's in this in a different position of where you had it. Is that clear? I don't. Are you guys okay with that? Yeah, I feel that's harder to push it. Because it's exactly. You're used to it. Exactly. Exactly. But what if a, mo- a 
kid starts when they're before their bar about mitzvahs. Well, okay, so we're gonna get there. So we're gonna get to the next thing. The next thing. So uh, this is the idea. So when th- this is the idea of when you have your own free will that puts yourself into a bad situation. Sort of what you were asking a little bit, uh, you know, earlier. This all happens if you're liable, if you put yourself in the situation. There's something, there's something known as a tinok shenishba. It's a captured child. Let's say, let's say a baby, or let's say somebody grew up, I don't know, in Siberia, not knowing they were Jewish, they don't keep Shabbat, they're not held liable for these things. They don't know any better. They know, they don't, if you don't know any better, then you're not held liable for it, obviously, because your free will is obviously not if you're going to keep Shabbat or you're going to make a blessing. You don't even know what Shabbat is. You don't even know what a blessing is. So of course, it's not going to be, you're, you're not going to be held liable for it because it wasn't based on your free will that put you in that, you know, in that situation. The, the problem where you would get, this is where it's scary, the problem where you would get in, in trouble for is you would be responsible that what you could have learned but you didn't. So some people say, you know, like, you know, this is what, I don't want to hear, I don't want to hear, I don't want to know, I don't want to know. I'm going to do it anyways, I don't want to know. So granted, you know, it's not such a simple thing, you know, should you tell a person, should you not tell a person. But if somebody avoids learning something, thinking that they're going to get away from it, you know, you're in for a very, very rude awakening. That's not the way that it happens. Not only do you get punished for the sin that you did, but you also get punished for not learning about it. You know, that's, that's like a, you know, it's like somebody who goes, you know, in front of court and be like, oh, well, I didn't know we weren't allowed to, you know, rob mini marts over here. You know, back where we come from, you know, this is what the government does, you know, so like, you know, we're just used to it. You know, like, it's, it's not going to work. Be like, oh, you didn't know. Okay, it's a warning, you know, like, don't kill any more people. You're not in the stands where you come from. You know, one of the stands, you know, Afghanistan, Pakistan, Afghanistan. <laughs> okay, so um, the idea is that you can't, you can't technically go and claim, ig- you know, ignorance where you should have known. But if, it, if there's a case that you, there's no way that you could have known, then yeah, you granted, you're not held reliable, you know, uh, you know for that. The Nair el brings down and says, and by the way, even before we get to that, you realize when you do a good deed, there are many levels on the reward that you get for that good deed. It's so fascinating. So when you're, let's say, uh, working, when you work, whatever the way that you work, that's the way, even if you're doing sales, even if you're working on commission base, even whatever it is, you get the salary, you get whatever it is based on your actions. The way that it works in heaven is that you get paid based on your effort. So if you're doing a mitzvah, that's why the, if you realize you never pray the same prayer twice. Even though we pray three times a day. A woman, uh, you know, two times a day, whatever it is, depending on... No matter how many times that you pray, it's never the same prayer because there's so many different factors. Your emotions, your concentration, everything is always different. Now, everything, every mitzvah that you do, there it depends where your free will is and where and how much d- emotion and effort you're going to put into it is how much reward you're going to get, uh, you're going to get for that, uh, you know, for that, uh, for that mitzvah. The, uh, that's what the Nair Lafel goes and, uh, you know, and says. And this is how we go and we, we understand that if you do a good deed by habit, just because you're just used to it, it's very different by doing a good deed by choice, which makes obviously sense, right? The, obviously, doing a good deed by choice, it puts it more into, uh, you're, more, you're more involved into, in, you know, in, the, in the mitzvah, and obviously you get more reward for it. Where do we see this? We see this by, by Saddam. And it says that Lot got saved from, uh, you know, from Saddam. Why did he get saved from Saddam? Because what happened was is that when Avraham and Sarah went to Avimelech, they went over there and Avraham goes to Sarah. Sarah was, was Avraham's wife and she was very beautiful. So he told us, tell her that I am your wife, I'm your sister. Why? I'm your brother. That'll be weird. Oh, yeah, it was Egypt, so maybe. He says, I tell her that I am your, I am your, I am your brother. Because what's going to happen then? What's going to happen then is that if they realize that I'm your husband, then they'll kill me so that they take you. But now if they know that I'm your brother, they're not going to kill me. Lot was standing right there the whole time. Avraham was very wealthy. Lot was, Avraham did not have any kids at that time. Lot was going to inherit everything. He was a very, very greedy person. How do we know that? Because he went to Sodom because of his greed. He went to do that, and what happened? He didn't say anything. He didn't say, oh, listen, you know, Avimel, you know, come here, I got uh, some good piece of information. By the way, you know, it's not his brother, it's that they're married. And they would have, they would have went and killed Avraham. He would have inherited everything. That's why he got saved from Saddam. But the question that that Mefashim asked, and be like, wait a minute, he risked his life for Achnasat Ochim. You know, when Saddam came and the angels came, he risked his life to go and save the guests so that they wouldn't get destroyed and murdered. And, and, and you know, this is at a, at a risk of his own life. What happened was is that the angels came into to Saddam and they were coming to go and, and take uh, Lot out. But Lot didn't know it at the time. And they, wanted, and they knocked on the door and they were guests. And Lot invited them in knowing that if he invites in guests, that's a death penalty. That's, that's a very, very big punishment in Saddam. So he went something. So when you look at the two scenarios, you see over here, one scenario, he risked his life, which is obviously much greater. Another scenario... 
he risked, pana, you know, a lot of money. So for some people, yeah, you know, panasa is still, you know, like greater than life. You know, it doesn't matter about the life. All that matters is about the money. But for the majority of the people, no, life is much more important. So why is it when it mentions the merit of, of, of Lot, that why did he get saved from Sodom? Because of what he did to, he didn't mention to Abraham and Sarah because of, the, because of his greed. Why is that better than risking his life for Achnasat Ochim? And the answer is because Lot grew up with Abraham. He grew up in Abraham. He saw that Abraham was all involved with just doing chesed, with achnasat ochim, with bringing in guests. He did, his free will wasn't like, should I bring it? It, he, it was ingrained in him already. It was like, of course I'm going to do achnasat ochim. There was no question in it. Where was the real test at? The real test at was this is true Bechil point, which was where, where by the greed, because that's where he had the greed. That's where he had it. This we see also by Abraham. Abraham, we know how big of a test Abraham and Akedat Yitzhak was when, I, when Yitzhak, when he was going to go and put Yitzhak on the, on the altar, because this is everything against what Abraham Abraham stood for. Abraham was the one who was saying, no, you should not put him on the altar. No, God does not want you to sacrifice your children. God does not want you to do this. And yet God tells him to do exactly what he's been preaching the whole time to do. This is the ultimate level of, of, uh, you know, of test that, that Abraham can have. And that's where the test is. That's where, the, that's where you get the bechira. That's where you get the free will as well. The, you know, the idea of this is that even though we have you know, tests in our life, there are, and we have free will in our life, Many things that we do, you know, do not have, and this is the scary part, many things that we do, we don't even use, we don't even use, uh, you, know, the, you know, the free will. Um, you know, think of this as a scenario. When I was reading this, this is from uh, uh, Noah Weinberg, I was reading this, I'm like, whoa, this is so true. You're driving in a car, right? And every time you make really major decisions when you're driving in a car, should I merge, should I look, how fast should I go, this, there's so many, but yet, sometimes we're driving in a car, and we get to the destination, and we don't even realize how we got there. We're like completely oblivious to the road. We, like, like we don't remember passing anything. We're like, I'm like, you just made life and death choices without even thinking about that. Isn't that crazy that we do all these things? Like, look how important free will is. And then some, so many things that we do in our life, we don't utilize uh, this free will. And not only, you know what the, the scary thing is? The scary thing is not only we don't utilize it, it comes into effect that it affects other people. You realize that, uh, you know, especially for example, I'll use the Gorsky community. The Gorsky community, the, um, there was a big movement of people keeping Shabbat. Now how did that start? It started with one or two guys starting to keep Shabbat. And I'm speaking of the, I don't know about the, the girl situation, but I know the guy situation was, you know, that's what I've been dealing with for a long time. The guy situation, it started with one or two people keeping Shabbat. And what happened was is that they started inviting their friends over. So they used their free will to keep Shabbat, and then they started inviting their friends and their friends, and then they started making meals in the synagogue, and they used to hang out in the synagogue. So eventually, what two people started keeping Shabbat, all of a sudden, 50 people started keeping Shabbat, and then, you know, goes on to their siblings, and so on, and the family members, and so on, and so on, and so forth. This all started by using two people utilizing their free will, which means is when you utilize your free will, you're not only changing your life, you're altering everybody around you. And if you realize, if you want to know a person, this is especially true when, when a, in the teenage years of a child. You look at that person about the group that they're hanging out with. I think that it's more important. The education, very important. But I think ultimately what defines a child, what they're growing up, is who they hang around with. The way that the groups is, and you have that, and I've noticed that. Because, you know, growing up, I noticed that different groups. And you had groups that became more religious. Why? Because one or two people became more religious. And everybody else just like, you know, okay, this is what we're doing. We're going to learn Sundays. So, yeah, let's go, let's go learn Sundays. And you had another group of people that, you know, okay, so we're doing marijuana on Sundays. So, okay, well, let's do marijuana on Sundays. And it's so funny how things happen. It's so comical when you look at it from the outside perspective. How you have one or two people generally change a group. And that's what generally it happens, especially if it's a tight-knit group. So, all of a sudden, you have, and this is the idea that the power that you have to go and bring people, let's say, to Torah classes. When you come into Torah class, you could go and invite other people. Now, when you're inviting other people, your, your free will to come all of a sudden is now affecting other people that are coming into the classes as well. And that affects other people and other people, and, and, and it goes on. So your free will, it, it's crazy. It doesn't only affect you. You'll be like, okay, my life. My, no, it's not your life. It affects everybody around you. Whether you like it or not, we're very much interconnected to each other. Everybody's interconnected to each other, especially to the close you know, of, of group of either friends, families, coworkers. We're very, very much affect each other. The, you know, the idea is that even though you know you have the education that does play a you know a role in this. So if you have a child and you decide public school or, or yeshiva, 
obviously that's going to that's going to affect that child's free will also. That's going to affect your free will of deciding to put in there. It's going to affect what that child's going to decide. You put a child in public school. Eventually, the child's going to decide, you know, heroin or cocaine or whatever. Okay, okay, I'm exaggerating. But um, you know, you're putting a child in, in, in a yeshiva. In, you know, in a, in a yeshiva. A yeshiva. Uh, you put a child in a yeshiva. They're not going to go and they're not going to start. You know, it, the test of their life is not going to be the same test as a public school kid's test. You know, I, I've dealt with people, kids in public school, and say, you know, like, how difficult it is, especially nowadays, for a boy to go into high school and watch his eyes. Are you kidding me? Like, you know, how do people, they undress to go to, to, go to uh, you know, to school. They don't, it's not, it doesn't work. They used to be, you used to get dressed to go to school. Now they undress to go to school. And, you know, and you expect, okay, well, you know, like, what? You know, my daughter is pregnant before she, like, you sent her with Julio and Pablo, you know, you know, and Christopher over there, you know, in, in PS 99. What do you think that's going to happen? They're just going to hold hands and they're going to say, <laughs> they're just going to sing songs together around the campfire. Like, yeah, teenagers, yeah, what are they going to do? Right? No, of course, you're putting a child in a situation, of course it's going gonna, it's gonna to affect that situation. Now, granted, does it not happen in the issue? No, of course not, it happens, it can happen anywhere, but you're, you're playing with the free will of not only yourself, now your children also, and anybody that is affected, you know, are, you know around you. The, and this is the idea that the way that we get judged is the same idea, we get judged the Rambam says like this. It says that he says that uh, the Rambam in Hilchot Shuvah, in the fifth chapter, goes and says that we everybody can be as righteous as Moshe Rabbeinu. Like, how is that possible? How can we be as righteous as Moshe Rabbeinu? The means is that we can. It's not like we're going to be Moshe Rabbeinu. Some people think that. Uh, somebody sent me a video um, uh, this week. It was actually an audio, but it was a, you know in a video format. Um, and I sent it to one of my uh, one of my groups. You know, the students and. Um, it, the video was a 911 call. I don't know if you guys seen that. It was a 911 call, and the guy calls up 911, and he's like, uh, he's like, hello, and he's like, he's like, yeah, and he says, um, hi, I am uh, Jesus, and 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 he says, uh, and he says, okay, he says, I broke into, I think it was Popeyes or whatever, one of the, you know, I don't know, fried chicken places, and he says, uh, hi, I just broke into, um, you know. Uh, what's it called? I just spoke into, you know, you know, oh, you know, it was a pizza, pizza hut. It was pizza, yeah. I just spoke into pizza hut. Um, and it, they were like, how did you break it? It's like, I broke the front window. I'm eating a pizza now in there. And, and the, the, the 911, you know, you know, recruiter was like, okay. Um, ha, you know, so he's like, no. He was like, he, so he goes to, he goes, this is Mr. Jesus, what's your last name? You're not supposed to say it, but he said, JC. You know, his last name was, and he's like, you know, it's like, you know, it's like, where, where do you, where, where do you live? And he's like, well, I just came from heaven. You know, like, I live in heaven. And I came down, now I'm eating a pizza. And he was, like, oblivious to the entire situation. Like, why are you asking me this, like, dumb questions? Like, obviously, you know, like, I'm, you know, the second coming. Like, I'm here. You know, just let everybody know I'm here. And, you know, so they sent, they sent a car out there. And they picked him up. He was still, when the police car came, he was still sitting there eating his slice of pizza. Yeah, they brought him in. It was some, like, Mexican guy. Uh, you know, I don't know who thought that he became, you know, G- yeah, yeah, it's real. Yeah, I, I can show it to you afterwards. And, you know, he goes, and he, it, it was, like, hilarious. But when I was thinking that, I'm like, all right, well, we're, not everybody's, you know, to that extent, but we all do the same idea. We all, like, you know, pretend where we are, and, you know, we're okay with what we are. You know, like, we're so confident, like, you know, this is okay where I am right now. The... The Rambam says, you know what it means that we get judged as Moshe Rabbeinu? Which means that Moshe Rabbeinu reached to the utmost of his potential. <laughs> We're going to get judged on how come we didn't reach as high level of Moshe Rabbeinu. We get judged on that, you know, that level. We get judged not for, we, we don't get judged compared to what other people are. We get judged to what we could have been. That is a very, very important concept. We get judged for what we could have been. And this is how we understand. This is a very, very uh, you know, important uh, concept. On, on, I get this question a lot regarding King David and Bathsheba. The sin of uh, King David and Bathsheba, right? So let's just try to explain this, uh, this idea a little bit. First of all, there's two questions. This is how Rabbi Akiva Tass explains it beautifully. Because it's like this. It says, how do we understand the miracle? You know, like you had the Jewish people. They left Egypt. They saw the miracles. They saw the plagues. They saw the splitting of the sea. They got the Torah. They got everything. How did they sin with the golden calf? Like, how did he sin with the golden calf? Furthermore, then he goes and he asks, what about King David? How do you have King David that go and did a sin with Bathsheba? And then even furthermore, it's even a greater question, the Gemara over there, the Gemara in Shabbat says, in page 55 says that, whoever says that David sinned is mistaken. But how does it make sense? Because the Torah says that David sinned. So like, how do you, how do you, what do you, the, the, the Gemara says, whoever says David sinned is mistaken. But the Torah says itself that he, that he, made, a, that he made a sin. So, the Rabbi Kiva Tass goes and answers like this. And he says that when the Torah judges a person, they're judging a person to its level. Not to your level, not to somebody else's level. Now, 
on King David on King David's level, it was guilty because he was on King David's level. But and he explains like this: Imagine you have two uh, engineers; they're discussing plans, and they have a, plans of a large building that they're constructing. Two big shot engineers. And then you have you know JC, the who, you know the painter, you know comes in, <laughs> and he looks at the plans, and he's looking at it, and he's like you know. And he's like, he says, you know, the building is never going to stand. He says, how? It doesn't make any sense to me. He says, what are all these squiggly lines? He says, it's not going to happen. It's going to fall down. And a short while later, the building falls down. Now, it could have been that it, it doesn't matter if the painter was right or wrong. But the chutzpah that the painter had, I'm like, who are you? Like, what do you? You you don't even know anything. But even if he guessed the wrong thing, even though he was right ultimately at the end, but you don't know what you're talking about. Like, what do you? What do you even? putting your input you know, in over here. The idea is that King David, it's inappropriate for somebody lesser than him on his level to say that he sinned. But for the Torah, it is to say that he sinned. Now, why is that? Now, if you realize, if you understand, if you read the sin of King David, if you realize what the sin was, you don't really understand what it was. Because what happened was, so uh, King David you know, sent Uriah. Uriah was Bathsheba's husband. He sent him to battle. And what, the way that it worked was, before any Jew back then, in that time, went into battle, they gave a get. They, get a, they gave a bill of divorce to their wife before they left the battle. If they came back and they survived it, they remarried their wife. If they didn't, then what does it prevent? It prevents an aguna. Aguna means that if, uh, if somebody is missing, if a man is missing, all of a sudden you don't know if he's alive, he's dead, he's captured, you don't know what's going on here, the woman is not allowed to remarry until they know for certain that either they die, the, the, you know, the husband died, or there's a bill of divorce, or there's some sort of definite you know, answer that we have over here. So in order to prevent this aguna, and unfortunately, you know, this, even to nowadays, there's an aguna crisis, we have you know, these issues to, to this day. To prevent that, before they went to war, they gave a bill of divorce. So, Bathsheba, when, David took, when King David took her, she was a divorced woman. She was not a married woman at that time. And in fact, the, the, and, you know, even though that Uriah went to the front lines, and King David put him in the front lines, the reason why he put him in the front lines is because he, he disobeyed a direct order from King David. Now, he, that's capital offense for a, a disobeying a direct order. Now, he had to go and die. Now, instead of dying as a criminal, King David said, you know what, let's put him in the front lines and let him die as a hero, as a warrior, warrior as a, you know, as a, uh, uh, you know, in the army, as opposed to, you know, as, as, a, uh, as, as a criminal. So he did, out of his kindness, King David put him in the front lines. And that's why he went and he eventually died. So the question is, so what was King David's sin? She was not a married woman. She, you know, he not only was divorced, he, you know, he was not alive anymore. Like, where, where was the actual sin? And in fact, the commentators, it, it's, it's so hard to decide what the sin was that the commentators are not even sure what the sin was. They're arguing, maybe, maybe this was sin, maybe this was a sin. They're not even sure what the sin was. So, what, indeed, it was a sin. But not for us to say. For, before, before he died or so he took it, even, even though the first time he took her before he, she died, she, he died, and then he married her after, after, after he died, but it doesn't matter. She was, a, you know, she was, not, a, you know, she was not a married woman. Happened to be the law, well, I don't want to get into details. The first child passed away, it wasn't that, and then the second child, you know who came from the second child? Shlomo Melech. King Solomon came from that, uh, from that, from that union. Mashiach came from that, uh, from that union. Now, even though it was a sin, but the chutzpah for anybody to say that it was a sin. It wasn't a sin. Like, we don't even know what the sin was. The sin, you know what the sin was? On King David's level, that was a sin. Because his free will was on a lot higher than, you know, than, uh, than anybody else. So the chutzpah is from one person to say that, that it wasn't a sin. That's what the Gemara and Shabbat means. Yeah. Um, how, I'm saying if, if Mashiach came from the woman, then obviously she was meant to be um, King David. So how, how would it have not been a sin? Because either way, I'm saying unless he married her before so, he married, like how would it have worked out in a way that it wasn't, it shouldn't have been even a sin. Yeah, so, the, so first of all, the idea is, is that, first of all, King David saw in prophecy that he was meant to be with her. King David was a prophet. So that makes the question even harder. Did he, say, did he see how he was going to be with her in the prophecy? Well, I, obviously, I, you know, that I, wouldn't, that I wouldn't know. But the idea is that, is that even though, and, okay, fine, I, I don't want to get too much into this, but, but let's, oh, I didn't realize how late it was. Usual announcement, leave, whatever, blah, blah, blah. Okay, if you want. So, um, if, so King David, um, what happened was is that um, there was a, you know, the, the, the prophet came over to him and after he did this, he went and he, and he said this scenario to King David to judge this case. The case is like this. There was a very wealthy person and there was a very poor person. You're familiar with this, okay? So let's go through it very fast. So the wealthy person had many, many sheep, many cattle. The not wealthy person had one sheep, one cattle, uh, one sheep, okay? And the wealthy person decided he wanted to make a feast. And instead of taking from his own cattle, he steals somebody else's cattle. 
So then he goes and he says, and he goes to, and, and, the, and the judge goes to King David and says, what's the judgment for that? So he's like, but how could someone do that? How could someone do that? He has so much and he's so much and then he went and he took from somebody else who has nothing? He says, that, you know, the worst punishment, worst punishment to do it. So he said, King David, this is referring to you. He says, why did you have to go and take somebody who was, you know, who was meant to be with somebody else? He says, you have so many options. You're the king. You could have anything. So from then on, he went and he was, you know, from that day on to the rest of his life, he was, he was doing shuba for the sin. But what was the sin? What was the sin? What was the sin? That single woman, she was, the, that, the, again, what was the sin in, maybe we could say in his eyes, is that the way, as a king, he shouldn't have done it that way. It shouldn't have been that way. Oh, so then we go to the free will. Was it destined for him to die? Was it not destined for him to die? No, the, it was his punishment. Yeah. It was his punishment, right. It was his punishment also for, you know, for, for disobeying a direct order. The bottom line is, the bottom line is, is that in essence, it was a sin, but we cannot, we don't, we cannot say like, yeah, of course it was a sin. We're not on the level to even start even to, to criticize. Who are you to criticize, David, King David? You're not even on the level of that. If anybody else would that, it's not a sin because everything was technically halakhically kosher. But for on King David's level, because on his level, that, that it was a sin. Not necessarily is it kosher? Is it like, to be like in a lower... Mahadran, Shemahadran, yeah. right? Yeah, it's a yeah. To begin with, Hashem, Hashem did this whole thing that Uriah will marry Bathsheba because of what uh, David did with Goliath. So really, like the free will, he didn't really have a free will because Hashem punished him, and that's why Uriam, Uriam married Bathsheba. But then the, he just decided to change, you know, whatever Hashem decided. Right. So the, like maybe there. there the was, truth is, is this story is I, we give a whole class just on the story. Because also how King David found him and he shot the arrow and then like at this and you know giving you the lessons of the test. There is so much that we could speak about this story. But and you're right. And like, but let's just leave it for now because otherwise we're gonna we're never gonna get uh, you know through this, you know through this. Maybe Bizarre Hashem one day we'll do we'll do uh, you know story of King David's uh, life. I think that's uh, very fascinating. The um, okay, but in any case the. The, this way, the same way that you do the like the generation of of let's say the Dardea, the the generation that did the sin of the golden calf. How do they do this in the golden calf? They had all these things going for them. How do they do it? Now, you, let's take like one example. You know, they complained from water. They were traveling in the desert and they complained from water. You're like, look at these complainers. They don't stop complaining. You know, you even if you read the scenario, the scenario is is that they were traveling for three days without water. They had women and children that they had to make sure that they have enough water. Three days without water, that's dangerous level. They didn't say anything for three days. Finally, after three days, they said, okay, you know, can we have some water? <laughs> Complainers. You know, like, how do, we, we are looking at that, and like, that's not complaining. You know, in the generation, that generation, 40 years, you know how many sins they did? 10 sins. 40 years, 10 sins that generation did. They were on an extremely high level. But because they're an extremely high level, they're judged according to their potential, according to their free will. That's where their free will was. That's the way that the Torah judges it. So when the Torah, the Gemara and Shabbat says, how we cannot criticize, you know, we can, whoever says that King David's sin is, is only mistaken, yeah, of course, because who are you to start saying it? The Torah judges a person based on their own potential. We don't know that. We cannot start judging that. We don't know that David said. And technically, when you're looking at it straight out, David didn't say, well, the, the, you know, and even when you look at the golden calf, when you look at the golden calf, they said that they, when they mentioned the golden calf, they said Elokecha. Elokecha, that's not divine essence. That's not God's divine essence. Elokecha is the way that God connects to this world, the way that God manages this world. Well, they're not, they weren't trying to replace God. They were trying to replace Moshe Rabbeinu. That's who they were trying to you know, replace. But on their level, that was a sin. Not only was it a sin, it was a sin of idolatry. So everybody gets judged on their own, on their own level. Think of it this way. Think of it, you, you know, there's two brothers, two, you know, two uh, family members. One brother always gets 50 and lower on their test. Like 50 is a good grade. Everything is lower. One other brother, 100. Now, two brothers come home and they get a test. The 50 gets a 75. The other brother gets a 95. For the 75-year-old brother, you know, you, you know, 75-year-old. For the 75, I <laughs> hope not. Well, maybe the parents are probably 100. So the, for, this, for the person, the brother that got 75, the parents throw a party. That's unbelievable. That's amazing. For the guy, with the brother who got 95, be like, well, you broke your, you know, 4.0 GPO. Like, what, you know, what, what's going on over here? Like, and they're upset with him. Like, that's not fear. Like, look at, I'm doing much better. But you don't judge based on other people. You judge based on your own potential and what you have. Now, this is the idea that is extremely, extremely important on utilizing a person's, uh, utilizing a person's free will. The, there are certain things that determine a, a, you know, a person's free will. It could be your abilities, your talents, your handicaps, your, you know, your personality. Everything, the, even the history, your own history of your own actions determine your level of your free will. Because if you messed up previously, we said your free will moves. The, 
And even even still, even if you have even if you have somebody who's born with certain tendencies, anger tendencies, uh, lust tendencies, whatever it is, there are certain people that are born more difficult to conquer something else. And you know, I think one of the easiest way for there are certain, let's say, women who have a very easy time with modesty, and there are certain women that have a very very hard time with modesty, very hard time. And each one gets judged according to their own potential. Not to say, be like, okay, listen, you know, it's not so hard for me, so it's pretty much okay for me. But for you, you know how to do it. Obviously, the halakha is the halakha. But God judges putting everything into aspect, everything into, you know, into place. But even if somebody's born with certain tendencies, you have the ability to change your nature. You have the ability to do that. Rab Chaim uh, Friedlander in Sifzeh Chaim goes and explains like this. And he says, you know, unfortunately what we do is if let's say we mess up. We're, we're not in the spiritual level that we need to be. We start blaming other people. Okay, if I grew up in a house like this, then I would have been like that. Okay, if I had friends, then I would, you know, I were good, then I would be. Able to, we start blaming everybody else but ourselves. Is that that is very incorrect? You have no one to blame other than yourself for you, your spirituality is dependent solely on you, not on everybody else that's around you. Granted, they have an effect on you, and you should circle yourself around good people. But at the end of the day, you are responsible for yourself. And this is how we understand the Gemara and Bachot. The Gemara and Bachot in uh, page 33b says that Hakol everything is in the hands of heaven except for the fear of heaven. And the Gemara Nida goes and explains this. The Gemara Nida in 16b says that if a person is going to be tall, short, skinny, fat, dark, light, rich, poor, smart, not smart, whatever it is, it's all predetermined. God already, if you realize that there's some kids already since they're little, do you know they're going to excel in life? And there's some kids that be like, oh, never. What's funny is, what's the funny, the funny part is, is that, is that look how life does, is that usually it's flipped around. The people that you don't think are going to go anywhere are the ones that are employing the ones that got 4.0 GPA, you know, GPA. They didn't go to college, but they somehow opened up a business and then they hired the person, you know, from Harvard and they, you know, they worked hard and had protection and got into all the things that they need to get to. And they, you know, they pulled all the strings, they end up working for the guy who was like, butterfly, <laughs> you know, like you're in the class. So um, go figure. Why? Because the idea is that everything's predetermined. What you're going to, how much money you're going to make, everything is predetermined already beforehand. What is, hakol b'day shemaim chutz mi shemaim. Everything's predetermined. The difference is, is that how spiritual you're going to be, how righteous you're going to be, that depends on you. How, what's your level of fear of heaven that's going to be? Now, on Rosh Hashanah, God decides how much money we're going to make that year. You have the free will. Are you going to make it legally or are you going to make it illegally? It's up to you. You can do that. And then you make the money. Are you going to, what are you going to use it for? That's your free will. You're going to give it to charity. You're going to donate. You're going to buy another Lamborghini. Whatever it is that you're going to, you know, it's like, I'm sorry. You're going to buy another Chanel bag. You know, whatever it is. I think it was these men. I don't know anything else that's expensive. I'm sorry. I know two things. I know Chanel and Hermes. And I don't know how to pronounce Hermes or Hermes or whatever it is. So Chanel, I know how to pronounce. So every time I always bring up Chanel. Louis Vuitton. Louis Vuitton also. I guess I, I know that one. But isn't Chanel like another different level? Okay. I know. Oh, that's right? Okay. I, I, I don't know. I don't know. I just know the old thing. Okay. Whatever it is. Whatever it is. Like yeah, these are expensive bags. <laughs> or whatever it is, an expensive company. So, yeah, if you want to spend, let's say, I don't know, I know, I know like, like 5000 15000 what is it? No, like a couple hundred dollars. No, Chanel is only a couple hundred dollars, the real ones? Where are you buying your stuff? Depends on the Oh, whatever it is. Yeah. <laughs> Depends if it's alligator leather. leather. From Africa. You know, you're just paying for those two C's or whatever they make it. That's what you're paying for. I don't know how to pronounce it either, but I think it's like it's Hermes. It's Hermes. Yeah. Hermes. Yeah. Hermes. Yeah. The letters are silent because it's French. You know, we don't like some letters. But we'll put them in there anyways. But you don't pronounce it. You know, you know and there's like 14 J's in that. I didn't hear one J come out of your mouth. Right? But in any case... Okay. Um... And it's also Spanish, you know, like if you've ever been to California, you know, if you've ever been to California, you know, so you know, anybody here been to California? I'm from California. It, it, La Jolla, am I pronouncing it right? La, La Jolla. How do you spell La Jolla? There's a J in there, right? I am like a foreigner, I'm like, I'm like one of those people, you know, like the, you know, like, you know, the Asians that come with the cameras over here and be like, oh, East 13th Street, oh, yes. You know, like, I come over there and I'm like, you know, can, uh, what's the direction to La Jolla? And they're like, what? They're like, I, I just read English. I'm sorry, I don't incorporate Spanish into my you know, understanding or that. You know, like, the whole silent letters, I didn't, uh, you know, didn't, didn't really... It's L-A-J-O-L-L-A. J-O-L-L-A. But it's not silent. It's, it's 
I Spanish, so it's a, yeah, it's a, yeah. It's a, yeah. But the problem is we live in America. Okay, so this is, if it was in Mexico, fine, do your thing. But this is California, all right? So let J's be J's. Whatever, I'm not going to get into it. One of my pet peeves. Sometimes I'll do a bedafka. Uh, you mean like, like right? <laughs> you know, it reminds me. And then we have to get back to this. My brother, my brother was taking a, um, <coughs> um, <laughs> my brother was taking his, uh, his driving test. You know, you go to the DMV, you know, um, we have to fast the day before, you know, like, okay. <laughs> so you go to the DMV, you have Kaparata Vanot over there, and um, he's sitting over there, and everybody takes, there's a written test to drive. I don't remember this. Well, well, all right. I am not the same age as you guys, okay? Okay, back then we were like, computers? What are com- computers? You know, computers were like this. And be like, you know, that was good. Uh, so, the, you know, the idea that, you know, so he was sitting over there taking his test and someone raises his hand back and they were like, yes. And they were like, I don't know if anybody's going to get this. They were like, I have a question, you know, professor. I don't know what they call professors, you know. It's like, um, he's like, what's a red ligate? A red ligate. They legitimately asked the question, what's a red ligate? Ligate is a light, but if you pronounce it, it was a, what's a red ligate. So um, this is, you know, you know. Now you can't ask questions all on the computer. Well, now you can't ask, right? So now it's not like that. Uh, yeah, whatever. Down the cop school, he was a big, yeah, whatever it is, a big righteous man. Also, it doesn't matter to me. But I'm saying, like, like at first, at first I'll be like, okay, that's pretty funny. But then I'm like, you know, technically he's just reading. You know, he's just reading technically. Where does the K come before? I know. Uh, No, no, it's true, it's true. Like, yeah, Kno stuff. Yeah. So, um, okay, anyways, so, all right, we'll bash on English a different time. Let's, uh, let's finish with free will. Okay, so the idea is that, is that everything, you, ha- you have many things that are already predetermined for you. How much money you can make, everything is already predetermined, but how are we going to use it, that depends on you. So it explains to Ali Shor, it brings up the Gemara. The Gemara in Shabbat, page 156a, goes and says that if someone's born under the, the influence of Mars, they're going to be more prone to, uh, to, to, bloodshed, to bloodshed. Now, what does that mean? So the Gemara says they could do a few things. They, they could be either one who becomes a doctor. They could be a robber. I don't know, whatever. It could be a, a shochet. It could be a mohel. There's, you're prone to this, but you could decide. You want to be a murderer. You want to be a, you know, somebody who's a mohel, someone who's circumcised. You could be a doctor who lets out blood. Or you could be, you know, you could be a robber. You, there's, you, you have, even though you have predetermined things, you could utilize it. That depends on your, that depends on your free will. And this is how Rab Noah Weinberg goes and explains it. He goes and says something very beautiful. And how we, uh, this, is, this is very important. How do we actually utilize the free will? It says the Pasuk in Dvarim, chapter 30, verse 19, that it says, I have placed in front of you the death and the life, and choose life. That was a very obvious. Like, what's, the, what's, the, what's the Torah telling us? Like, I have life and death, choose life. But like, who chooses like, death, please, to go? You know, like, well, no one, like, who's choosing death? So, the, so I'm not Weinberg says something very, very interesting. He says, you know, when you look at something at suicide, you know, Rahman al when you look at something at suicide, suicide is a motivation to escape. You're escaping reality. And Rabnok Weinberg says that, you know, nowadays we are expert time killers. You have, uh, you know, what is it, web surfing, YouTube, just YouTube. Um, uh, you ha- it's like you go in a rabbit hole, but you're, you're killing time. You're just like not doing anything for a long period of time. Uh, you, know, there, you know, in the secular world, there's bar hopping. What? I learned a lot about animals. Okay, you know, so, okay, so you're watching that. Some people watch how people fall. Um, and this is what they, you know, this is what they, um, this is what they, you know, they, they, they enjoy in life. Be like, yes, fall for me. You know, old lady, fall down the spears. Oh, yes, my pleasure. Yes, that's hilarious. Thumbs up. Okay, so... You know, there are people after a long day, they veg out. They just sit over there, they just veg out. That explains Rav Noach Weinberg. He explains Rav Noach Weinberg. He says, killing time is suicide on the installment plan. I thought this was like a genius statement. Let me say that one more time. Killing time is suicide on the installment plan. Because suicide is you're escaping from reality. Killing time, you're also trying to escape from reality. So, you know, when we're doing it, we're, we're just going and we're, we're just like wasting our time. Bachata bachay means choose life. You have two options in front of you. It's not necessarily just death, but it's also, you, you could not choose life. And we're going to explain what that means. Reb Noach Weinberg, before we explain in depth what the Pasuk means, Reb Noach Weinberg goes and gives you uh, three ideas on how to utilize your free will. Number one, 
you first of all have to realize that you have a choice. You have to realize you have a free choice. People don't realize that they have free will. Like if you're driving, the example that we gave before, you can decide to take this road or take that road. But you're not going to decide if you're just doing it without thinking. If you stop for a second and be like, wait, I have the ability to decide what I'm going to do. Then you know, people go and they tell me, I can't keep Shabbat. You could. You, are, you do have the ability to keep Shabbat, but they convince themselves that it's not even a choice. It's not even an option. There are many people that sell themselves short because they don't think that they can do it. And if they don't think they can do it, that's it. They're done. They already lost. The, so step number one is to realize that you have a choice. And you really do have a choice. You have the choice. You have the ability to do anything that you want. Number two, says Rabbi Noach Weinberg, do, don't be a zombie. Don't be a zombie. You, you know, nowadays, we're, a lot of, we're, we're other people's puppets. Uh, the way that it works is you realize that many things that we do we do it based because that's what other people do. And the, things, the way that we dress, the cars that we drive, the phones that we buy, the things that we do, we base it either because of social media, because of advertising, because of marketing, because of that's what our friend's doing. We're, we are technically other people's pop- puppets. The geniuses in the marketing world, the real smart ones, they know how to manipulate you to buy what they want. That, you know, like sometimes it's not the smart business, it's not the smart product that gets you to buy it, it's a smart marketer. That it's a guy who knows how to go and tell you that you need this cup with a hole in it. You just need it. And if you need it, and they can convince you you need it, then you can buy it, even though it's a silly product. But if you convince you that you need it, then you buy it. Now, if everybody has a cup and a hole in that, then all of a sudden, everybody has it. I said a cup and a hole. I could really said Crocs. I mean, it doesn't, whatever. Uh, no. But the truth is, no, the Crocs are comfortable. Um, it just looks like you're walking around and whatever. Okay, so whatever it is, you know, there are certain things that if you realize the genius is not behind the product, it's behind the marketing behind it. It's a convincing. And many choices that we do in our lives, it's not based on our own free will. It's based on like, we don't realize we have a choice. We're making other people's decisions for us. We're making our own decisions based on other people. Like, it's it's my body when you stop for a second and you think what you have the ability to do. And this is also like, also people have a job. They're stuck in a job that they don't want to be it. Just because you were, had a job that was good for you five, ten years ago, since I'm not lying, but it doesn't mean that it's good for you now. It might not be good for you now. And don't be stuck in a situation that you're not supposed to be in that situation. You have the free will to get out of it. You, and now, now it's, sometimes it's very difficult. It's not easy. But know that you have the ability to go and get out of it. Prayer really, really helps in, this, in, you know, in these situations. The final thing, the third thing, is, you know, not Weinberg explains, it says that, there, you have a struggle between the body and the soul. The, there's always a struggle between the body. The body chooses a pain-free, work-free environment. That's what they want. They just want to cruise through life. They just want the least possible. The, the soul wants, has a drive to reach your potential. You, your soul is like, okay, let's do it. Your soul is the one that wants you to come to class to learn Torah. Your body wants you to come to class to eat sushi. Whatever brings you to class, come to class. It doesn't matter. I want the comfort. The soul wants the meaning. <laughs> Well, yeah, exactly. Uh, yeah. The, the, but the idea is that there's always, this is where both of them are in the same thing. But let's say the body would be like, okay, I'll just catch it online, you know, the next day. So I'll just sit in the couch today and I'll, you know, veg out, I'll web surf and I'll, you know, stalk people that I haven't seen, you know, in 14 minutes. And, you know, you'll go and you'll start looking into everybody else's life and you'll sit there for four hours and whatever, you know. Your body wants that, your soul wants to, is, thri- is, thri- is thriving to go and, and chase after, after your own, you know, your, to reach your potential. The test is, the test is, is who you're going to listen to. It says over here in, in Devarim, in chapter 11, verse 26, it says, God is saying, I'm placing in front of you curse and blessing. What's the blessing? If you listen to God. Your, your curse is if you're not going to listen to God. Did you have the blessing and the curse? What is the, the, the blessing is if you're going to listen to your soul or you're going to listen to your body. You keep on having this, this, this thing that's going to constantly spill you apart. Okay, your body wants you to do this sin. Your body wants you to do this thing. Your soul does not want you to do it. You have the free will to decide. Choose life because the life is the soul. Who is in essence you? You are your soul. You're not your body. And if you've ever noticed any if you ever, you know, unfortunately, been around somebody that passed away, and if you've been in that situation where they were alive in one moment and you saw them pass away, you look at their body, and you could you could say that the person's not here anymore. It's not like it's him, but he's dead or she's dead. It's not the, the there's something gone. You could see that something, and it's not just the fact that the heart's beating because yeah, you could do mechanically. It's not the fact that there's brain. It's the fact that the soul is gone because the essence of who you are is your soul. It's not your body. This is where the Pekea Avot, and we're almost finished over here. The Pekea Avot goes and says like this, in, in the fourth chapter, it says, You should run to do a mitzvah and run away from doing a vera. Explains the Ali Shara, says, why am I running to do a good deed and running away from doing a bad deed? 
So it should be the same. I should run to do a good. You run to do a bad. Like what? What is this running towards and running away? And that explains the Ali Shar explains uh, you know that in order for you to have free will, if you if you would want to equally do a good deed and a bad deed, you would do a good deed. No one in the right mind will do. It. If you have both things chasing you, if you have a good deed chasing you and a bad deed chasing you, then there's no option. Of course, you're going to do the good deed. But in order to have free will, in order to have the ability to choose bad, it has to chase against you. And in order for you to do good, it has to run away from you. That's just the essence of free will. So it says in the Mishnah Pelkei Avot, you have to run to do a mitzvah, but you have to run away to do an avera because a mitzvah runs away from you and a, mitzvah, and a, and a avera runs, away to, runs towards you. Yeah. Well, Pelkei Avot, fourth chapter. But Ali Shar explains it like that. The, and this is how we understand the, this is how we understand the tshuva process. And we'll finish with this. We have five, Six more minutes will be done. Bezal Hashem. Bli Neda. Bli Anara. Bezal Hashem. Mazel Tov. Okay. So now, um, the, 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 ch- the Tshuva process. When you think about the Tshuva process, how does the Tshuva process work? You're like altering the past. You'll be like, okay, you did something really bad. You're like, okay, I'm sorry, God. You know, you hit yourself a few times in your chest. I'd be like, I'm sorry, I'm not going to do it again. All of a sudden, you're changing your, like, where is the spiritual logic behind it? Now, Rabbi Kiva Tass explains this, you know, beautifully. He says that, you know, the, even before I even explain it, the Rambam, you know where the Rambam speaks about free will? The Rambam has the Yad he has the Mishnah Torah, he has all the laws of the Torah. Yet, where does, out of all the places, where does he decide to, use, to speak about free will? I guess Tshuva. Tshuva, yeah, very smart. Well, only one person was, I guess. So yeah, Tshuva, <laughs> he speaks about it in Tshuva. Now the question is, why is the Rambam, Maimonides, out of all, every mitzvah that you do, and every avirah that you do, is related to free will. Why out of all of them did he decide to put it in the tshuva section, in the, in the, in the chapters of, of tshuva? And the answer is, is that what happens by tshuva? When you're doing tshuva, you're changing your will. You're, it's the ultimate use of free will. Like, at what, what's the ultimate way of tshuva? It says the Rambam that you're placed in a situation, the same situation that you fell last time, and you don't fall this time. That is the ultimate tshuva, which means is that you messed up, and you did a certain sin. You know how you know you really did tshuva? You found yourself in that same, yeah, I mean, you found yourself in that same, not you place it, you found yourself in that same sin, and you don't mess up this time. That's how you know you did the legitimate, the highest level of, uh, you know, uh, you know, of tshuva. The, the, the idea is that, it doesn't, the tshuva doesn't change the past, like the sense was still there. It changes you. You're not that person anymore. So what we think is, the, you know, it's not that the sin disappeared, the person disappeared. The person is not there anymore. That's what the Ramah says you could, to, uh, to so much extent that you could change your name. The, you're not the same person anymore. What does that mean? Because when you do tshuva, you won't want to do it anymore. You won't want to do the sin anymore. That's the difference between tshuva out of fear and tshuva out of love. If you do tshuva out of fear, that means that you did tshuva out of fear, which is good. It's still a level, but it's not as high as doing tshuva out of love. When you do tshuva out of fear, meaning that you're fear of punishment. So if there was a way that you could remove the punishment and you could get got free the avera, the sin, you would still kind of do it. And so you're still changing your will. You're still not doing it, but it's on a lower level. What is a tshuva out of love? Tshuva out of love means that you know the effect that it will have on your soul. You know that what God told you, and you don't want to go and tell, go against God. It's, this is, it doesn't matter on what the effect of the sin that's going to be. It doesn't matter if it was be allowed at one point. If God doesn't want to do it, it's a much deeper changing of the will. Do you understand that? If you're doing tshuva out of love, you're, it's, it's a much, think of it this way. In a relationship, Let's say a man is scared of his wife. Generally, Americans, right? That's a fair statement to say, right? Um, at least the Ashkenazim. I don't know. Okay. So, <laughs> but that's just the opposite. Sfadim especially. So, um, the, when you're looking at this, when you're looking at this, you know, you know, scenario, when you have, you know, somebody, a husband who doesn't want to do something because it's going to hurt his wife. There's two ways. Either he doesn't want to hurt her because he's afraid of the retaliation that she's going to do back to him, um, or, or afraid of the credit card, whatever it is that he decides he's going to be afraid. He's going to be afraid of something, of fear. That's one way he's not, going to, he's not going to hurt her. Or the other way, he's not going to hurt her because he loves her so much and he doesn't want to hurt her. Now what's, a greater, now what's the essence of really him not wanting to hurt her? The greater one is doing it out of love. Because out of fear, if let's say he wanted to do something that was pleasure to, pleasure to him, but it hurt for her, if he could have a way that it would never hurt for her, then he would do it. But if he does out of love, then regardless of whether it hurt her or not, it doesn't matter. I love her and I don't want anything to be, you know, to, to jeopardize it. That's the difference of love and fear. So when you do, the, the reason why the Rambam place the, place the, 
essence, the, the, law, the way that he discusses the laws of, of free will, the, the halachot of free will, he discusses it specifically in Shabbat because that's the ultimate, ultimate use of free will. You're changing your will. You're, you're completely changing something that you want to do to something that you don't want to do. That is the ultimate use of free will. We said in the beginning, what is free will? Free will is not when you are able to do whatever you want. Free will is when you have the ability to say, no, I don't want to do it, even though that I, you know, I want to do it, but I know that it's not the right thing to do it and I decide I'm not going to do it. That is utilizing your free will. This is, um, you know, we'll finish with this final thought. In Mishle, in Proverbs, chapter 21, verse 1. It says, Lev melech biyad Hashem. The heart of the king is controlled by God. The Malbim goes and explains, it says that God controls the rulers. Why? The kings, God controls their decisions. They don't have free will. They don't have free will like, you, like regular people. Why? Because every one of their decisions affects so many people. So God takes away their free will. And this is what's going to happen in, in the times of Mashiach. When Mashiach comes, we're not going to have the free will. The Rambam, Ramban, Nachmanides, in Devarim, chapter 30, verse 6, goes and explains that in the time of Mashiach, man will not have the, you know, the, the ability, should I do this? They're going to all do the good thing. There's not going to be, there's not going to be the free will that we have today. The Satan is going to be shechted. We're not going to have the Sitra Acha. We're not going to have the evil inclination anymore. This is why, you see, in the seventh chapter, in the Hilchot Shiva, the Rambam goes and says, now that you have free will, do Chuba. Because now that you have free will, now that you have the ability, do not say like, you know, okay, well, now that you have the ability to do chuba, you have to do chuba now. Because now you have the ability to do chuba. Chuba doesn't go forever. If a person passes away, that's it. You can't do chuba after, after you know, you can't go up to heaven and be like, ah, oh, I just missed it. I kind of want to get like a five more minutes. You know, like, you know, like it's not like a little kid going to bed. You know, you can't, like, once it's over, a game over. Mashiach comes, you can't all of a sudden go and decide you're going to change your, you're going to do chuba. Chuba has to happen right now. Furthermore, the Rambam says that not only that, you have to do tshuva not only on your sins that you did, but also on your character traits. People don't realize this. If a person is an angry person, a person is, you know, goes after their desires, a person goes after whatever it is that in their own personal character traits, even, says the Rambam, even if it didn't manifest into any action, you still have to do tshuva on it. You still have to do tshuva on it. Now that you have the ability to do tshuva, now you, have, now you really have to do tshuva. So what we learned over here as a quick recap is that even though we all have free will, not everybody utilizes it. People tend, tend to go and, you know, based off just their urges and their desires, and they don't even think for a second that they have the free will. We have to realize that not only we have the ability to have free will, and it affects everybody else, but all the most it affects us, and it affects our children for generations to come. Every single thing that you do is going to affect your child for generations to come. The way that you're going to act, the way that you're going to do, the person that you're going to marry, everything affects your children. So when we're thinking about that, I think, think about the far-ending effects of our free will. It should really wake us up that we really make a huge change in the world. We use we make a tremendous difference in the world. And let us make a positive change and not a negative change. Any questions? Okay, let's work, let's work clockwise. I think that's the easy way. Is that counterclockwise? Let's go like this, okay? Yeah. Uh, the reason we have free will now is that Hashem can give us reward and all that stuff. But when Mashiach comes, I'm going to have a free will anymore. Isn't that like, isn't the whole purpose of him giving us free will in the first place? Like, You're asking what's the purpose of Mashiach? The, Somewhat of a level of, of, of free will. Right. So the way that... The, the, I mean, you can't really judge... Like, right. So I speak about this in the Mashiach classes, that the purpose of the Mashiach... Mashiach is, is an intermediary state between this world and Olam Abba. So it's needed for that purpose. Now... That, when you get to that purpose, there's no more free will needed in, to, make, to, to make those decisions for what's needed in that point. As we know it, yes. And it's going to be in transitions. Yes, and the reason is to get to Olam Haba. So the way it works like this. We have the free will now. And based on the free will that we go right now is based on how we are going to uh, live in the times of Mashiach. And that's going to lead us to Olam Haba. So it's kind of like instead of like working towards buying a car, everyone just gets free cars. And then you got to soup it up. And then, and, no, and then you just get a free car. That's it. Well, not necessarily. Well, well I guess somebody could get an you know, Oldsmobile, Olam Shalom, and other people can get... Uh, Mercedes. Every oh, oh, that's, how are they going to live? That's a, that's a question. That, that's a difficult question. The when the time Mashiach comes, you think of Mashiach as um, utopia on a, on a, on a, on a eagle. It's Israel. Yeah. Um, it's okay. Let me let me explain like this. Let me explain like this. This is what I, we explained in. Uh, this is what we explained. I believe also Rabbi Kiva Tatz also explained this. You know, in this way. Shabbat, you're not allowed to cook on Shabbat. Yom Tov, you are allowed to cook, right? You are allowed to cook on Yom Tov, you're not allowed to cook on Shabbat. When the time comes for like Olam Haba, that's going to be like Shabbat. You're not allowed to change anything. Everything that is, it already exists. Yom Tov, 
you are able to, uh, times of Mashiach is like Yom Tov. You are able to change something, but how could you cook on Yom Tov? Only if you prepare beforehand. So in this world is what we're preparing. Mashiach times is like the Yom Tov, uh, Yom Tov, where you're able to change something, but it's only based on what the changes that you made in this, in this life. But it's not going to be called any, any, any more whole. No, 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 I'm not, I'm not saying, in, I'm just using that as an example. Right. So like, weekdays, you're not going to have the ability to do things that you're doing now. But yeah, and it's, it's in stages. It's in stages. So you look at the Rambam. Well, it's in stages. It's in stages. In the beginning, it works in stages. You look at the Rambam, it says there's not going to be any difference except for Sheba and Malchus, and you're not going to have the Satan. So you're going to be able to serve God without... But it's going to be in stages. When you study it in depth, the truth is we didn't finish the Mashiach series. We should probably finish it. What's going to be when Mashiach comes? So maybe we should, maybe we should finish it, we'll wrap that up once we finish this series. Okay, next question on this side. And then we're going to get this way. This way I don't bounce back and forth. No questions over here? Yeah. yeah. Um, so if, if free will is like say, being able to say no to our desires and like, um, let's say, no to sinning, that basically means we're only like utilizing free will whenever we do good things? Not necessarily. You li- yeah, no. So you're li- utilizing your free will for every aspect of you have. But I'm saying the utmost, the highest level of free will is where you have... Or one of the high. I can't say the high. One of the highest levels of free will is if you have choice A and choice B. You want choice B... But you know the smart choice is choice A, and you choose choice A. So it's not, you, you're making free will on everything that you decide. What you want to, like God said, let's say, how much money you're going to make. But you're going to decide what business you're going to get into, for example. What job you're going to get into, and things like that. So you're using, utilizing free will for everything. Not just, not just that. Okay, moving along. Uh, yeah. yeah. And then you, um, sorry. Yeah. Uh, the, the, I think it was the Ali Shore you said. Yeah. Um, about, just, I just didn't really understand. Um, they're running away from from why is, why does running away from the sin? sin make it free will? Because sin, so sin chases you, and a good mitzvah runs away from you. That's the way that it's free will. Because if both of them chase you equally, which means is that you both have the same desire to do the same same thing, you of course will choose the mitzvah over the sin. Like why would you choose? But and if they're both running away from you then you'll never do a sin. Like, what, you're going to chase after... I mean, some people are very you know, adamant about it, but, but I'm saying, like, generally, you're not going to run after a sin. So in order to make a free will, it has to work in that angle, or, or like that. So then, it's like what she said, you're really only choosing... Like, I don't really get that, because you're still only, no, because only choosing good, otherwise you're just following your desires, and your desires are just instinct, and instinct isn't free will. You're, you, but you're still utilizing your... Oh, so that's a very good point. If, it, if I wasn't clear on that, if you do a sin, you're utilizing your, your free will to make the sin. The problem is that... To make it an equal playing field, it's chasing after you. That, it just puts it on an equal playing ground. Um, so everything, everything's on equal playing ground. It has ground. to be like a decision. It's not yeah. to be like, a, oh, obvious question. It has to be a decision. Right, 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 right. Okay, yes. So, like I was saying before, like the kid. Let's say, I don't know, this example, a kid starts to bite their nails when they're, let's say, like nine years old. And then, okay, so they're boys, so they hit bar mitzvah. But it's already a habit that's very hard to break, so then they're violating Chavez, but it's, they started doing it before they had their to told. Right, so somebody, let's say, by, somebody with, thank you, thanks for coming. That if somebody has, if somebody started a, a bad habit, even beforehand, they still have the ability, they still have the free will. Granted, they were put in, so, yeah, so the free will moved, I'm saying, like, how what level that they're going to what level they're going to hold it you can pick it up it's fine what level it's going to actually count as only God will adjust it but of course they still have the free will to stop doing it like, I'm saying if they're so young then by the time they grow they're, they're much older and it's very very hard to stop if they were dividing it right they still have to stop it it doesn't mean but I'm saying like obviously their test is not the same test as somebody who never bites the nails but I'm saying like I guess I'm saying like, I, obviously they're punched because they're still doing it, but they didn't, it's not like they got the choice to, to start once they have their YouTube There are many people that don't have a choice either to begin. Some people are born angry people. Some people are born with bad character traits. That doesn't mean that they had the choice willing to do it. Granted, at some point in their life, in the previous life, maybe they did have it. But at all said and done, they, are, they don't have the same choice, but they're still held liable to change their actions. And it's more difficult for them, that's true. It's more, somebody who would never bite their nails, somebody who would always bite their nails, it's much easier for someone who never bites their nails to not bite their nails on Shabbat. Of course it's different, of course. And, and granted, you know, God takes that into consideration, but at the end of the day, it's still not allowed. Okay, any other questions? No? Okay, Chazak You've just experienced another Torah class brought to you by TorahAnytime.com.